So the CAPM is one of the primary models people use to understand why some assets give high returns and high yields and why some assets don't. And here's the basic idea behind it. So when people develop the CAPM, they said, all right, we need some behavioral assumptions. How do people behave when they buy assets? And the, the idea is that people like returns and people hate uncertainty. So let me, let me tell you what that means. So let's say we have two assets. We have one, maybe one asset is the Tesla share and one asset is the Siemens share from the last video. And the Tesla share, if we put in 100 euros today, we have the chance of getting 150 or um, 50 euros tomorrow. And with the Siemens share, if we put in 100 euros today, we have the chance of getting 200 euros or zero euros tomorrow. We said that people like returns. And with both assets, the average payoff in period two is 100, right? But with the Siemens asset, the, the uncertainty is much higher, right? Because I jump between 200 and zero. And with Tesla, I jump between 150 and 50. And the ba basic behavioral assumption is that people like this more. They like more if they know or if, if they are sure what's going to happen tomorrow. Okay. So this means we can say that people who we think act like this actually optimize return divided by variance. So they want the return to be as high as possible and they want the variance to be as low as possible. And so this simple fraction here um, grasps, grasps our behavioral assumption in math. And the second assumption we're going to do is that people are smart and rational. In other words, they understand the math and they know what they're doing and they correctly optimize and solve this problem. So in other words, we say people optimize return divided by variance and people do this correctly. So there are no math mistakes in the market. There are no dumb people in the market. Everybody understands math and it works out. So under those two assumptions, let's think about what two investors in the market, we call them Mike and Alan, will do. So Mike has a portfolio and he looks at all the assets he can buy in the market. And Mike is rational and smart, as we have assumed. And so he, is, he understands the effect of diversification. If you haven't watched the video on diversification, please do it now because it's important for this stat. And because Mike understands diversification, he uses his skills to optimize return over variance by choosing the stocks and the right weighting. So maybe he invests $100,000 and he puts, I don't know, maybe 30% in Tesla, maybe 20% in Siemens, and maybe the rest in Google and Amazon. And this portfolio gives him a return over variance ratio of maybe um, one quarter, right? So maybe the return of the portfolio is 5% and the variance is 20%. What will Alan do? Well, Alan has the same assets he can buy in the market as Mike does, right? Because they're both investors in the market. And we have also said that Alan is smart and that he understands his math and that he will also app optimize return over variance. We know that the optimal return over variance ratio is 5% divided by 20%. And we also know which portfolio actually achieves this return over variance ratio. It's exactly the portfolio that Mike has chosen. So what will Alan do? Well, Alan will invest into the same portfolio. It's as simple as that. And we could go on and go on and go on. And, and if we think about what our third investor, Steve does, well, he will do the same thing and buy the same portfolio as Mike and Alan. So what does this mean in the end? Well, in the end, if we look at what everybody in the market buys, then the market portfolio is the efficient portfolio. Everybody will hold the same portfolio. So what does this mean? So if we look at the market, so if we look at the world and let's say the world has $100 billion, then we can see what is the optimal distribution of this wealth by just looking at how the wealth is distributed in the world. Because we assume that every single player in the market does his or her turn rationally, 
we can say that the result, the market portfolio, is rational and efficient as well. So maybe let's take a step back. What, what have we learned? We have learned that if we assume people to be rational and to optimize return over variance, then the market portfolio will have the optimal return over variance ratio. So the next step of the cap M is to say, all right, we have understood that the market portfolio is a very special portfolio. Can we actually use the market portfolio to understand what is the return of a single asset? So what's the return of a Tesla stock? And here's the idea. Well, the idea is to say, okay, everybody holds the market portfolio and this is a plot on the market portfolio. So let's think about um, the stock of Tesla. So let's say that Tesla moves very, very closely to the market portfolio, right? So what does that mean? So that if we add, so Tesla acts very similar to the market portfolio and there's little diversification from Tesla. Let's take another asset, maybe gold. And gold moves inversely to the market portfolio. So gold moves like this. And gold moves inversely to the market. So gold moves like this. So you see that every time the market portfolio goes up, so, um, gold goes down and the other way around. What does that mean? Well, gold decreases the variance of the market portfolio, while Tesla increases the variance of the market portfolio. So what does that mean for the individual returns of Tesla and gold? As everybody holds the market portfolio, they only care about how much risk actually, how much risk the individual stocks contribute to the market portfolio. Tesla contributes a lot to the market portfolio and gold contributes actually negatively to the market portfolio. So when we want to measure how much um, an individual stock contributes to the market portfolio, well, we use the covariance of the asset and the market portfolio, right? The covariance of Tesla and the market portfolio is very high and the covariance of gold and the market portfolio is very negative, okay? So this is our core measure to understand if gold or Tesla contributes highly to the variance of the market portfolio or not highly. So the return of an asset should be proportional to how much it contributes to the risk of the market portfolio. So the only thing that's now left to fulfill the cap M is to do some kind of normalization. So I said that the covariance between the asset and the market portfolio is a very good measure on understanding how much risk a single asset contributes to the market portfolio. So when we write a model, however, we would like that the market portfolio itself has the return of the market portfolio itself in the model. So in other words, if our asset is the market portfolio, we would like to have the return on the market portfolio here. And how do we do that? Well, we divide by the variance of the market portfolio and we multiply with the return of the market portfolio. So that means in our formula, if our if our asset is the market portfolio, then the covariance of the market and the market portfolio is equal to the variance of the market portfolio. So this is one. So our model will tell us that the return of our special asset, the market portfolio, is equal to the return of the market portfolio. Perfect. So now if we have a different asset like Tesla, we can also use this neat formula to understand its return. We just plug in the covariance between Tesla and the market and we use our formula to get the return of Tesla. And this is it. This is the cap M formula and by use by calculating the return on the market, the variance of the return on the market and the covariance between any asset and the return on the market, we can actually calculate what the return of the market is. And in the next video, I'm actually going to tell you why we need this, a why this is such a breakthrough and actually use a lot in finance.